Please stand again for the gospel reading. Alleluia, alleluia. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. When the Advocate comes, Jesus said, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you so that when that hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to you or advantage, to your advantage, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. And about justice because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of Truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own, but will speak whatever He hears, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because He has taken what is mine and declared it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that He will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to, to you, O Christ. Amen. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Those of us who took the time to watch the English Royal Wedding yesterday heard a wonderful sermon. I'm not sure I'll be able to match the words of Bishop Michael Covey, who is the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. He spoke a wonderful sermon of love and of how love can transform the world, how love can really make the world a new place where there is no poverty, where there is no injustice, where there is no inequality. For as he said, love overrules all. Now he was speaking to an estimated possible audience of three billion people. On the day of Pentecost, Peter was preaching in Jerusalem to maybe around 5,000 people. We don't know exactly how many, but it certainly wasn't three billion. And yet that sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost has in its sense self-transformed the world because it was the beginning of the church. The beginning of the good news of Christ spreading out into the whole world and touching literally billions of hearts through the centuries. After his resurrection, Jesus returned and spoke to the disciples and taught them and encouraged them in their faith. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is writing about this and he says Jesus had appeared to over 500 people. He says some of whom have died, but most of whom at that point were still living and could testify that they had seen the risen Christ. At his ascension, which we celebrated last week, it says there were about 120 believers present. 
So not that many people. How many were there on the day of Pentecost when they were gathered together worshipping God? Maybe 120, maybe a few more. Some of them maybe would have been his disciples back up in Galilee and wouldn't have been gathered in Jerusalem on that day. We don't know how many. But we do know that they were filled with boldness and Peter got up to preach fearlessly and 3,000 people were added to the number that day. So however many believers there were to start with, there were over 3,000 by the end of that morning. For it was only 9 o'clock in the morning when Peter got up to preach. Ten years ago, as many of you know, I had the privilege of speaking in Jerusalem to 3,000 Jews overlooking the walls of the city. I was there to speak to the Gay Pride March, uh, which had been organized, and I just happened to be in the city that week for a conference representing the lesbian and gay Christian movement. And so I was asked to speak, and I talked well, my text was the one of Jesus' words saying, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I spoke to 3,000 Jewish people overlooking the walls of old Jerusalem, but I can't say that 3,000 believers were added to the number that day. I don't know if any were. But I do know that on the day of Pentecost, Peter's sermon went out with power. 3,000, at least 3,000 were added. He spoke about the words of the prophet Joel, that in the last days the Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. All flesh. Young and old, slave and free. And later Peter would come to realize Jew and Gentile. The Holy Spirit is the power of God given to us to transform lives, to make lives begin again. But it's not magic. It's not just a matter of saying some words. I used to think that when I first became a Christian, if someone believed and said a few words and was born again, their whole inside was transformed and they became instantly new people. Well, in a theological sense, that may be true, but in a practical sense, it takes a long time for God to work in our lives and to change us, to work through us, to make us more like Christ. If we were all transformed instantly, the church would be a much better place and a much better witness to the world than it is. For many of us fail so often to reflect who Christ was and that pattern in our lives. But transformation in the Holy Spirit takes time. Those 3,000 people that came to faith on the day of Pentecost wouldn't have instantly become kinder, more friendly, more helpful, better people. If they walked on in the faith, as many of them did, but maybe many also fell away, it would have taken time for them to become more like the disciples Christ was calling of our human nature tends to selfishness. Sadly, I've seen this this week in following David's death and then disputes with people here about the inheritance and, and all that that's come up. It just shows how people, when they're in fear and worried about losing things, they lash out. It's that very natural animal instinct of fight or flight, that we have to defend ourselves, we have to defend our corner. This can only be overcome with the power of God and the power of love and forgiveness. And forgiveness is an act of the will. You don't necessarily feel like forgiving somebody. You have to sometimes really decide, I will forgive them. And we can only do this really through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't think this is applying to Christians only for, it says the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. And wherever we see forgiveness and love, we see God working. As it says in 1 John, and this was a passage quoted yesterday by Bishop Michael, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And I think we can see that as we see love expressed wherever it is around us, that that is a sign of God working in people's lives. 
We should love to come to church on a Sunday. It should be our delight. Because we come to meet with God and know God's love. But we also come to meet with those who we love and those who love us. Our Christian family who we know will forgive us whatever we do and that we are a community together. That should be what we expect when we come to worship. The Holy Spirit is offered to all. In the words of Peter in that Pentecost sermon, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that word saved, as we know, means will be made whole, will be healed, will be reconciled both to God and to his brother or her brother and sister. Jesus, in the days after his resurrection, the 50 days following his resurrection, said peace repeatedly. When he appeared to them, he said, Peace be with you. My peace be on you. He talked of his peace. And that's not just an absence of anger or war, but it's that idea of shalom, of wholeness, of, of reconciliation. And he said he would go away, but send the Holy Spirit, who would be our comforter, our advocate, the one, the word, means the one who comes alongside us, the one who is with us. You can't really translate the word from the, the Greek into English because we don't quite have that word. But it means the one who's alongside us, the friend who will stand with us, who will comfort us, who will care for us, who will speak on our behalf. That's who the Holy Spirit is. <coughs> And the knowledge and the power of the Holy Spirit gives us the strength to stand firm in our faith. Recently there's been a number of priests who've been killed or shot dead in the Philippines because they've been standing with the poor and standing against injustice. That's because they've got the Holy Spirit working through them. And we've seen the same thing happening in other countries around the world. But God's power in the Holy Spirit can break through into the most impossible situations. In North Korea, in Palestine, in Iran, God can, and we can pray that sometime soon, will transform those places. If you're skeptical about that, just think of what we do have now. That we do generally have human rights. That depending on our country, we have free health care, we have free education. These things don't happen by accident. They happen as God's Holy Spirit inspires people, Christians and non-Christians alike, to change the world. To stand up and to say this is wrong and this must be changed and to refuse to sit down until it has been changed. That is the Holy Spirit working in the world as well. So on this Pentecost Sunday, we probably said what we usually say is that we're having a potluck following our worship. But we're not having a potluck following our worship today. Because the potluck is part of our worship. Because it's part of us being the people of God in God's presence. As we share food with one another and talk to each other and show love to one another, that is still part of our worship of God, our confession that God is worthy because we're acting in the pattern of Jesus to one another. There's a slogan which you hear in England at Christmas, maybe in other countries too, that a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. Meaning don't just give a puppy as a Christmas present, you have to take care of it for many, many years, and you have to think wisely. Well, I can misquote that one and say, the Holy Spirit is for life, not just for Pentecost. We celebrate the Holy Spirit on one particular day each year. But the Holy Spirit must be working through our lives throughout the year. Every day, every hour, for that is the source of our life. The source of the life really of all humankind. For where love is there, there is God. So my prayer for us this morning is that we will, each one of us, ask God into our hearts again. And that we can begin and continue to be transformed in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Amen.